so I, I want to share with you the work uh, of what we've informally been calling the scalable COVID-19 testing group uh, that we've carried out over the last year and a half or so at UCLA. Um, and um, just to kind of uh, take you all back to, you know, February, March uh, 2020, when we were all sort of sitting watching uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, spread around the world. And I think kind of quickly flipping from, um, oh, this is some like, you know, distant public health news to this is something, this is something that's going to, you know, affect all of us very, very, you know, imminently and severely. Um, you may remember and hear a couple of headlines from February 16th, coronavirus test kits sent to the states are flawed, CDC says. Um, how testing failures allowed coronavirus to sweep the US as corona numbers uh, rise, CDC testing comes under fire. So testing was very much in the news. And um, we did not have the capacity uh, in this country uh, to test and we were not testing the people we should have been testing, which would have potentially allowed us to um, arrest uh, the spread of SARS-CoV-2 before it got uh, completely out of before it got completely out of control. Um, so I actually remember on Twitter uh, having a discussion with Dan Vergano, who is a terrific uh, science reporter I've, whom I've interacted with for, for any number of years, uh, where he was posting these stories about the failures and the source of these failures and how they could basically get PCR primers to work. And uh, you can see me here chiming in um, back in uh, toward the end of February saying, I would think this shouldn't be so hard to get right. Um, uh, so, and then I've basically spent the last like, you know, 18 months trying to justify that, uh, justify that statement. So, um, uh, like uh, many other research universities, um, UCLA uh, shut down its research labs on March 20th of 2020. This was the, this was the note we got. Um, so all on campus operations were suspended with the exception of those that are essential and cannot be conducted remotely. So this was on March 20th. Um, on, uh, literally on March 21st, uh, I got together with my colleagues, Jonathan Flint, who is, another, who is a psychiatric geneticist here at UCLA, and Eliezer Eskin, who is a computational biologist and chair of the computational medicine department. And we started talking about, you know, we're sitting on all of this uh, genetics and genomics uh, equipment and infrastructure. Uh, can't we use that to help? Um, and you know, none of us really had any experience dealing with uh, infectious disease or diagnostic testing or anything in this sphere. Um, and we certainly knew we weren't, um, you know, competent to try to develop, uh, you know, any sort of therapeutics or vaccines or whatever. But testing is something we thought um, we could try to get a handle on. Um, so. Uh, basically, in uh, in March uh, through in, in March and April of 2020, we moved very quickly. Um, we partnered with another investigator, Sri Kasuri, who is on leave from UCLA, um, running a, a startup called Octant. And for completely different reasons, they had developed some RNA analysis technologies that at the time they were starting to repurpose for. Um, uh, for COVID test, for, for SARS-CoV-2 testing. Um, and so we got together with him and, us, and a scientist in my lab, Josh Bloom, and started running some experiments uh, to take these ideas and bring them, bring them to practice. Um, we had uh, a key member of the team, Valerie Arboleta, who is uh, both a faculty member in my department and a, and a trained pathologist with actual experience in diagnostic testing joined the team at about that time. And I'd say by about the, by sometime in April, May, uh, we had the technology validated. We had the tests running on contrived samples in the lab. Um, and then we spent the next couple of months uh, kind of working out the logistics, validating the technology, doing some shadow experiments where we tested UCLA students who were here over the summer alongside uh, the official commercial testing that UCLA was doing through a company, um, filing for FDA approval, et cetera. Um, so 
uh, that part actually turned out to be a lot more challenging in many ways than, uh, than the science. Um, so let me kind of walk you through all of that, uh, all of that journey and where, where we've gotten to by, uh, by today. So um, I think uh, if uh, I'm sure many uh, folks here had no idea what uh, you know quantitative RT-PCR was, or probably haven't heard of it until you know a couple of years ago, and wish you haven't. Um, but this is the way most current diagnostic testing gets done. So these are not the at-home tests; these are the tests that are done in the lab. Um, and what you do is you start with a sample and one of the sort of metrics for, uh, we'll talk a lot about limit of detection, right? So how much virus needs to be present in your sample for you to detect it. And uh, the sort of uh, number that gets, uh, the metric that kind of gets used is GC per uh, milliliter. So GC stands for genomic copy equivalence. So that's basically how many molecules um, of the virus you have in your sample, um, and uh, in, an, in, in a milliliter of in a milliliter of sample, uh, the samples that actually get tested are substantially smaller than that. I don't remember the conversion off the top of my head, but this probably corresponds to something like twenty copies of the virus actually present in the sample that you got in your uh, swab or saliva sample from uh, from the patient. Um, and as I, I mean, I'll see that our technology can actually go down to basically a single copy of the virus. Uh, as long as there is even one molecule of the virus, uh, we have a decent shot at detecting it. Um, although, uh, you, you know, to be confident in it, we need, we need a few copies. So the way uh, quantitative RT-PCR works is PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, where you basically, uh, through a combination of temperature cycles and uses uh, of special enzymes, um, run a number of cycles, and each time uh, that you run a cycle, the number of molecules of your target molecule in the sample uh, doubles. Um, and so, what you do in the what these instruments do is they run this PCR, um, uh, these PCR cycles. The molecules get fluorescently labeled, and you watch which cycle, you know, at what cycle number the, the the fluorescent signal that you have crosses some threshold for being above uh, background. And that's, if you see that, you call, you call it detected. And the more copies of the starting material you have, um, you know, shown, uh, shown here, the sooner that'll happen. So that's why when people talk about low CT, like for example, if this happens at 15 cycles, that means there is a ton of virus. This is somebody who is shedding uh, a lot of virus and is probably extremely contagious. Whereas if you pick something up, at the CT, you know, in the high 30s, that means there may have been a couple of molecules of the virus in the sample, but it's kind of like on the on the edge of detection, right? Um, so, in addition to the kind of technical uh, teething difficulties that uh, the CDC and subsequent tests had. Um, there are a number of other limitation, inherent limitations in this technology. It's logistically pretty challenging to run this at scale. Um, the qPCR machines became a huge logistic bottleneck. These are not like there. There are a lot of sort of standard PCR machines that can do a lot of tests that can run a lot of reactions. Um, these quantitative PCR machines with the fluorescent readout are highly specialized, and they were basically nowhere to be found in the early days of the pandemic as everybody tried to ramp up the testing. Um, there are a lot of supply chain bottlenecks that you run with, uh, that you run into at pretty much every step of this protocol. Um, it's pretty pricey, both in terms of the actual cost of doing this test, um, and even more so in terms of what really gets charged or billed for doing them. Um, and so, as a result, even though the, the assay itself is pretty quick, it's uh, you know uh, a couple hours maybe. Uh, all of these backlogs meant that at many of the most crucial phases of the pandemic, when you most needed to do a lot of testing, um, there were backlogs that led to you know days and sometimes many days uh, to get results. At which point, the results are basically completely useless if you're not getting back your infection status. You know, within a day or so, it's not really effective to find out uh, that you were positive, you know, a week ago and then have spent a week basically infecting everybody you've come into contact with. 
So we developed the technology that differs from this in a number of ways. Um, so we've, we've called it swap seek because at the beginning, every, the, the, it was pretty much complete accepted dogma in the field um, that nasal swabs were the only way to find uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, in fact, it turns out that saliva is pretty much as good and a lot more you know, convenient and tolerable for people, especially if they're going to test very frequently. Um, so uh, we thought at one point of switching to spit seek, but we just, you know, we've, we've, stuck, we've, stuck, we've stuck with the original name. Um, so we get a specimen and we're kind of specimen agnostic. We run tests routinely that use both swabs and saliva. And I'll show you a little bit more detail on that. Um, and then we run them through a regular plain vanilla PCR machine that just amplifies uh, the sample for a whole bunch of cycles. We don't, uh, you know, watch the reaction go. Um, for a signal, which allows us to do it on much more routine and inexpensive equipment. Um, and the key thing we do though, is in addition to amplifying the, the samples in each well, we also add a molecular barcode that then allows us to combine all of these samples for every step after that and uh, run all the subsequent steps of the reaction in parallel. Um, which is a huge uh, labor and time saver and cost saver. And then our readout is not fluorescence, but we take all of these amplified molecules and run them on the standard uh, Illumina sequencers, which are kind of the workhorse of all the genomic analysis. Um, and these instruments, depending on exactly, you know, whether you go with like the smallest, cheapest desktop uh, ones to the machines, uh, to the sort of workhorse machines of the genome project, you can run anywhere from thousands to potentially hundreds of thousands of samples um, in parallel. We've we've gone we've gone to the scale of running you know tens of thousands, not not hundreds of thousands uh, in a run. Um, so there are several key differences here. One is um, we don't actually need to go through all these uh, upfront steps of RNA extraction. We can go directly from the swab or the spit uh, sample into the PCR. So that eliminates a lot of the sort of cost and bottle and logistical uh, bottlenecks. Um, I already talked about the barcoding um, and, and the readout. So this allows us to do, uh, to make this process kind of very simple and streamlined. And we sort of talk, we talk about it as sort of uh, light automation. So there is definitely automation involved as you'll see, but there is also, um, we've tried to automate the steps that are the real, in, uh, you know, serious bottlenecks in terms of cost and, and throughput, but also keep the steps uh, that are e better done by a human and a small number of humans uh, manual. Because, um, we, you know, we, we totally bootstrapped this whole thing. We didn't really have any, you know, resources, expertise, staff, whatever to do this. Um, so we really wanted, wanted it to be pretty lightweight and something that uh, anybody could, could set up. Um, right. uh, can I uh, ask a, a quick question? Uh, yeah. How many, how many primer pairs are you using per, per sample, just compared to the, the RT-PCR tests, which are usually using multiple, multiple primer pairs per, per sample? Um, so we've run, uh, so far we've run everything with, with one. So we target, we have a, we have a target within the spike, uh, within the spike gene. So the S, the S uh, gene of, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2, we've tested additional, and, you know, we've, we've made sure that our primaries aren't uh, affected by any of the variants. So we don't have like just dropouts. Um, we've tested primers against N, et cetera. And it's just a question of kind of uh, simplicity uh, and cost, but you can definitely add amplicons to this of, uh, of other stuff. I I'm just wondering because this is, uh, you, you could potentially multiplex this pretty significantly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll talk, I'll talk about, oh, okay, okay. I'll yeah, talk yeah. about that at the end where, where, yeah. So, I mean, this was all kind of done like under, you know, on a wartime footing sort of, right? So we just wanted to, you know, have a test. It's, you know, we, we, are, we are, you know, testing at scale under CLI as I'll show at the end. So we need something that's robust, approved, standardized, et cetera. But whenever we've had sort of more uh, downtime when, ca when case rates have been lower and we haven't had to do as much actual testing, we've done a bunch of R&D and obviously we have a lot, of, a lot of stuff on the drawing board for the future as well. Um, 
So yeah, so like I so like I said, uh, basically um, in the process of amplification, there is a separate tag in each one of these wells that we tack on to the target sequence uh, of the virus that then allows us to distinguish which individual they, th this came from. We actually use um, two tags, not one, what are known as unique dual indices. So, so, we, so we can do a lot more error correction um, in the process. So after the sequencing, we basically have two barcodes, right? One is the one on the tube that the sample came from. That's like an actual you know, QR code type barcode. Um, and now there is this molecular barcode in the sample. And after the sequencing, we can, we can, put, the two, we can put the two together. Um, so we also use um, a, a, a part of this protocol that Sri, that Sri Kasturi's group developed is a spike in standard. So we have a synthetic uh, chunk of this target sequence of the virus. Um, but unlike the actual virus, there is a six nucleotide stretch that's flipped backwards. And this is also present in every well. So this basically allows us to see that our reaction is working properly and that we get this amplification and we can normalize um, between wells because there is the same amount of this stuff present uh, everywhere. And this, uh, this does help. So what I'm showing now, um, are th these are our sort of validation plots on the left. Um, you see, uh, so the, the x-axis here is this uh, genome copy equivalence now per the actual reaction. So you see that uh, the points here are zero. So that means there is no virus there. And then four, 16, et cetera. Um, and on the y-axis in this case is just the number of reads of the virus that we see in each sample. Um, so you see that that's, uh, that's pretty decent. Um, there, you know, it, 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 there is a, there is rough linearity here, um, but uh, at four copies per reaction, we're not doing so great compared to the zero, um, and it's it's pretty noisy. And on, what I've done on the right is normalize, uh, compute the ratio of the number of samples of the virus over the number of these spike in molecule reads that come in from the spike, and that. Uh, both separates all of our actual, you know, positive samples from the negative controls and makes the response more linear and tighter in terms of being able to read out the quantity. So I think that's just basically what I said. So we actually have uh, two internal controls in each sample. One is this synthetic spike in that allows us to basically say that our reaction is working and normalize. Um, and the other is we also have, so I guess in terms of the primers, we do have another uh, set of primers in there for, the hu for a very common human gene. Um, and that allows us to tell that the sample collection worked. So basically, if you see a signal that says, yes, you're detecting the human gene, yes, you're detecting plenty of these synthetic reads, and no, you're not detecting any actual SARS-CoV-2, you can confidently say that that sample is negative and it's not a failure. Of your um, of your process. Um, so uh, our first uh, our first uh, test here is uh, just comparing apples to apples uh, using uh, NP swab, nasal uh, nasopharyngeal swab samples. Um, so this is uh, our limit of detection sort of curve. So now we're back to genomic copy equivalence per ml. And yeah, I told you a thousand is basically where the, um, st the standard qPCR reported LODs are. And uh, we, we're about uh, four times uh, more sensitive than that. We can go down lower to that, uh, but now you start, uh, you start to miss some of the samples. Um, and then in B, shown in B here is uh, samples that were tested as negative from the clinical lab and samples that were tested as positive by the clinical lab, and we can nicely uh, separate those two. So then um, the next step was to do this in an extraction-free setting. So we just take the swab, put it into a simple buffer solution, and then run the reaction straight from that uh, solution. Um, and we lose about a factor of two in sensitivity doing that. Um, but it, that's still, uh, you know, at least as sensitive as, uh, as qPCR. 
um, and it, again, you know, separates uh, separates the positives and the negatives nicely. And then um, the ex in the extraction free testing of saliva, we probably it probably costs us another factor of two in um, in the limit of detection. So now, but but again, it's sort of at the level of uh, the standard qPCR tests. And now we start to get some disagreement uh, with the clinical lab testing of the NP swap uh, samples. Not a lot, um, but now uh, you know we're testing the same patients, but sampled at somewhat different times because they basically go back to some of their people and. Um, have them spit after they've already done the nasal swab. And in all the studies that have been done comparing, you know, saliva versus swab, I mean, first of all, if you like swab somebody's left nostril and somebody's right nostril, they won't be completely concordant. Um, and so, and there are some people that you, you'll pick up as positive by saliva and not by nasal swab and vice versa, because people just shed virus differently in their nose uh, versus in their throat, including differently at different phases of the infection. So there is there is kind of no such thing as a true um, gold standard uh, here, but we, but this works pretty well. Um, so that's sort of the technology validation. We can have uh, good detection of SARS-CoV-2 uh, with a you know, very reasonable limit of uh, detection in unpurified uh, nasal or saliva samples. Um, then we have to deal with the logistics. So you start uh, realizing that um, you know funnels in the funnels into which people spit are pretty small until you need a million of them. Um, you know the tubes that the samples go into, likewise, and until they start showing up in these pallets, and you need two hundred thousand of them. This is uh, ten thousand box stop uh, test kits that we distribute. Um, and this is what uh, primer plates uh, look like uh, for, for a million tests. So this is all the sort of stuff uh, at a scale that, you know, none of us were really, uh, you know, dealing with before we started doing this. Um, so uh, one of the keys to this is we use these uh, special tubes um, that, uh, so into which either our nasal swab goes or our saliva sample goes. Um, and they're, um, uh, you know, they're, they're all uh, they're all barcoded, and we have the collection sites. So, this, so who, the, these samples are typically self-collected, but whether they're self-collected or collected with some assistance, they already go. These tubes go into racks um, at the collection sites. So we get them in these uh, 96 well racks that are compatible with all the standard laboratory automation. And that's a huge labor saver for us and allows us to do it without a huge staff, just like getting, you know, bags of uh, loose tubes and having to rack them and all of that stuff. Um, we do uh, an, an inactivation step um, at night at 90, in 95 degree uh, water bath to make sure that uh, there is an activation of the virus. And then we have all these gizmos that I'll show you videos of that automatically, uh, you know, uncork all of these tubes um, and deal with and transfer all these um, all these samples. Um, this is what we use for our actual spit test. Uh, so there are these little funnels that, uh, that fit perfectly into these tubes and you can buy them on Amazon for, you know, pennies uh, a piece and they're normally used for uh, people who, you know, make perfume at home and then need to fill little, uh, little perfume uh, but, um, bottles. Um, so as, as I said, uh, the tu these tubes have uh, two barcodes, so there is a barcode on the side and there is a barcode on the bottom that's uh, read by all of these sort of plate handling uh, devices. Um, and uh, one of the fellows here, Gabe Boland, uh, designed a swab that's compatible with the small collection device. So you need you know, a, a swab with a shaft that's comfortable to use. But then these are designed so that they're very they easy, very easily break off at this point right here. So there's so 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 somebody swabs themselves, 
uh, sticks this into the tube, does, you know, turns it a little bit, it breaks, uh, they throw out this part and this part gets capped and goes into our process in exactly the same way as the saliva samples do. So um, let me try this. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I want to show you guys uh, two short videos that kind of illustrate the slight automation process. So there is the pre-PCR step, so dealing with everything before the amplification, and then there are all the post-PCR steps. Um, and this is the sort of thing that like working with something like, you know, forensic DNA or ancient DNA, you have to rigorously separate those pre-PCR and post-PCR steps. And that was actually an issue in the CDC, in the initial CDC testing. If any, once you start amplifying, right, you're making, you know, millions and billions of uh, copies of your molecule. And if that gets, uh, some of them inevitably will, you know, get out into the environment. And then that'll contaminate every test you do. So you really have to have physical separation of these areas, as well as extreme care when you, you know, go from place to place, et cetera. So first we heat the samples at 95 degrees for 30 minutes. We use a flatbed scanner to record the location and barcode number of each tube. Then we use an automated decapper to remove the caps from 96 tubes at once. Using the 96 well pipetter, we add sample to each well of a 384 well plate that has been prepared with primers and master mix. Finally, we load and start the thermal cycler. So that's um... So that's the so that's the first so, so that's the first step, and you can kind of see what we mean by automation light, right? There is a bunch of machinery there; it's being operated by a person. So we didn't like go for the full. We looked, at, we certainly thought about and considered and looked into options for kind of robotizing the whole thing, but that would have taken way longer and been uh, way harder, and we were obviously under a lot of time pressure to actually uh, have this working. Um, So, are you guys, uh, can you still see that? Is, are you still seeing the video, the YouTube window? Yes. All right. No, we just see this. Oh, there's another video now. So this is the second step. First, we remove the plates from the thermal cycler. Using the Integra Viaflow, we pull all of our barcoded samples together into a single reservoir. Next, we transfer the pulled PCR product into a conical tube and vortex. Then we use magnetic beads to purify our library. We use two beads purification steps to isolate fragments between 100 and 200 base pairs. Next, we measure the concentration of the library using the qubit and adjust it to the appropriate concentration for the sequencer. Finally, we load the library and the sequencing primers into the sequencing cartridge and start the sequencer. So you can so you can see there that um, in uh, 
in uh, in the in the first part, uh, what Lila is doing is dealing with all of these samples that are still in this plate format. In the second uh, in the second video, Chaitan, um, as soon as uh, it as soon as he pulls it uh, into a, into a single reservoir, then he is working with one tube throughout the rest of the process until it goes on the sequencer and that single tube now contains uh, thousands of individual uh, of individual samples. All right, so I did that, I did that. Um, So um, yeah, so uh, this is kind of like to recap uh, the timeline. In April, we did the basic uh, technology of 2020, we did the basic technology validation. In May, we moved uh, the operation out of my, of my regular lab into some dedicated space we got from the, from the medical school. Um, in June, we developed uh, automated laboratory processes. And by the end of the month, we submitted an application for uh, the emergency use authorization to the FDA. Um, in July, we, did, we designed the saliva collection kit and ran uh, an operational pilot with our student health center where they were already testing the students and they um, took a sample for us in parallel so we could compare the, compare the results. Um, in, uh, I think it was uh, at the beginning of August, we posted a preprint describing all of this work and opening up all of our, uh, all of our protocols and methods so that anybody else could set up a similar operation. Um, in September, we started to really prepare for the testing, hiring and training some laboratory staff and ordering supplies at scale. Um, in October, we received an emergency use authorization from the FDA and the CLIA license, so that's a clinical laboratory testing license uh, from, the from the state of California. Um, and uh, in November, we, we, we had this uh, autom automation compatible swap design working, and we started a first pilot uh, of testing with uh, UC, uh, UC Santa Barbara. Um, so, we had done uh, really, uh, you know, minimal real world testing to that scale. I think in November we did, you know, some hundreds of samples, and then um, just and then this was all basically ready to go just in time for the big uh, winter surge. So um, in December we started testing for UCLA Health, um, and at about that time there was a requirement um, for all uh, healthcare workers in California to start getting uh, regular weekly testing. So we took, so we, so we undertook that. Um, we also started testing for Caltech um, and then later for UC Irvine Pepper and Pepperdine. Um, so uh, we quickly went from basically doing, you know, pilot scale testing to doing well over a thousand samples a day. You know, we think we maxed out at about 10,000 uh, per week in that phase of testing um, toward the end of January. Um, then uh, as uh, people started getting vaccinated and the case loads went down, uh, the, our volumes, uh, the testing also went down and our volumes started to decrease. Um, we also at the time, uh, took on another project to do a bunch of sequencing of COVID genomes to track variants. So remember, this was when alpha was uh, increasing in frequency and before uh, delta was really uh, before delta was really a thing. We started doing some uh, tests for uh, for Cal State. We took over the sequencing at the main campus at UCLA. We also signed up to start doing some school testing for the LA Unified School District, which is I think the second largest school district in the country. Um, so up to that point, we had done uh, you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 150,000 tests. Um, this is what it looks like now at uh, UCLA. So there are these uh, you know tents uh, set up with vending machines. 
and anybody with a campus ID can put the ID in and for free get two of these test kits twice a week. So here is, um, I'll, show, I'll show you one uh, once, I'm not, uh, once I'm not screen sharing. Um, and um, there is uh, there, there is there is the collection uh, there is the co the, co the collection uh, spot uh, so they can spit in there and uh, drop it off and then uh, within a day get uh, get the result from our lab. Here's somebody actually using it. Um, so as we know. Um, things didn't just kind of continue to peter out uh, at the levels that we hit at the extremely low levels we hit in June. Um, we had uh, the Delta variant arrive just in time for, for back to school. So our testing uh, wrapped, up, uh, wrapped up dramatically over the course uh, of August where we were testing you know, 20,000 uh, samples. Um, and then toward the end of September, when all of the UCLA students came back to campus and we did the entry testing for all of them, we got up to about 35,000 tests uh, in that one week. So that's 7,000 tests a day. And we've been running at somewhat higher volumes uh, for the last couple of weeks um, since then. So this is, you know, this says that we've done over 300,000 tests. I'm guessing over the last couple of weeks, we've probably added another 100,000 or so to that, uh, to that total. Um, um, and um, we also, of course, um, in addition to uh, expanding the technology uh, for COVID testing, so as I had uh, said before, adding the target of a different uh, gene, uh, SARS-CoV-2 gene, um, and uh, improving uh, you know, various other aspects of this in terms of identifying variants within the past. Um, we also, of course, uh, want to be ready for the next pandemic, um, if and when that arrives. So we want to be able to identify, sequence, and diagnose a variety of respiratory viruses at scale. Because, um, uh, you know, we really, we really feel like if, uh, you know, we had the capacity that we had in January of 2021, um, in January of 2020, for some other reason, or just because you know people actually took preparedness seriously, we could have made a real difference um, in the in the course of the pandemic, at least uh, at least in Southern California. Um, so there is a huge uh, support staff that's gone into this effort. This is. Uh, Don, our laboratory uh, director, and uh, you know, just a small sample of her team. Now there are many more uh, folks actually there uh, testing every day, working in shifts, etc. Um, and here are some of the key uh, folks uh, I wanna I wanna highlight. Um, so Jonathan uh, and Eliezer have been uh, the co-leaders uh, with me of this project from the beginning. Sri Kasuri's group at Octant uh, developed the technology and started the repurposing of it for COVID testing. Um, Omai Gardner is the head of clinical diagnostic testing at UCLA, who's been uh, a huge uh, supporter of uh, and help to our efforts. Um, you met Lila um, and Chaitan, uh, two technicians who really got this project off the ground in the early stages. Um, Chang Yuan um, and Yi uh, did a lot of the kind of lo logistics and uh, Val and Josh really uh, were the hands-on uh, leaders who made, uh, who, who, who made this whole thing, uh, who made this whole thing happen. Um, we received, uh, you know, philanthropic support from a number of uh, individuals, foundations and institutions um, and uh, grant support uh, to make all of this working. And there was a great community of uh, folks in genomics all over the country and the world. Um, talking about COVID testing, especially in the early days, and really exchanging information um, uh, very freely in real time to make sure that everybody could get up to speed on testing um, as quickly as possible. Um, so I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna stop, uh, stop talking here and uh, take, Take your questions.
know, discuss, have some have some time for discussion. Thank you, and I will. Um, I can monitor the chat as well as if people want to raise their hand, and I can I can call on you guys in sequence if you have questions. So go ahead. So Vince has a question: uh, How can organizations adopt the tool for their own testing, and is it for hire? Um, you know, is it for hire? I mean, I guess uh, we've sort of looked into taking this uh, taking this commercial, and I think kind of the uncertainties of how long that uh, how long this is going to be needed, et cetera. Um, Oh, it, the question is, can they use our facility or do they need to establish their lab? So, I mean, with some, with, I think uh, doing it outside the immediate area would, the main uh, is, well, other than our capacity, the main issue would be um, transportation, right? So right now, everybody we deal with can either drop off the samples, you know, at UCLA, or if they're at other, you know, Southern California, uh, you know, schools and colleges, etc., they can just like courier them to us, drive them to us, whatever. So, if you start try trying to transport them from further afield, that um, I mean, it's logistically a pain, but it also uh, adds to the turnaround time, and you really don't want to delay the results for very long. Um, in terms of people setting up their own labs, I mean, we've tried to make that everything we do as open and accessible uh, and publicly available from the beginning as possible. So there is now a published, uh, there is a published paper on SwapSeq, but uh, there are also a bunch of resources for exactly what you would need to set it up. Um, but you know, it's uh, it's not so it's it's not sort of it's not so turnkey. I think somebody could get there, you know, in a in a matter of uh, months. But uh, it would take, uh, you know, depending on what expertise and resources they already have in place. But it would be some work. Mike Worth asks, can, if you can say a bit more about the barcoding of the individual RNA samples, um, so they can be identified after mixing them all together. Yeah, I mean, so basically, like uh, you know, you you, ha you have to amplify the samples in each well, right? And um, in a, you know the the primer the primer sets we use basically have these barcodes built in, so they add uh, this design, and you know, so, so that means you have to order a whole. You know, you you're not like using a single PC a pair of PCR primers that amplify SARS-CoV-2. You have these primers. You have these large sets of these primers, um, where they're basically the same in terms of targeting the virus, but each one has uh, has a different uh, barcode or pair of barcodes uh, attached to it. So during the amplification process. Each one of these 384 wells, or however many sets of these plates we use, uh, gets a little different chunk of sequence. Ruben's asking uh, with modern multiplex PCR methods, you could plausibly detect most known human pathogens simultaneously in a single sample. It would be very epidemiologically interesting if you could add more pathogens to your current test while we have the near universal COVID surveillance testing. Have you thought about adding other probe sets? Yeah, so I mean, we've, we've thought about this for a while and like over the summer when our testing wasn't as uh, intensive, we spent some time looking at, I mean, it's, it's sort of a question of how many do you add um, and what what that does to kind of the cost of the, the cost of the test, right? Because we want to be able to, you know, be very efficient in our COVID testing. But I think we've looked at um, adding a couple of subtypes of the flu um, as well as RSV, and that would probably cover a lot of that space. And that's definitely like, you know, we're envisioning that at some point, um, you know, maybe as we get through the Delta wave, uh, there won't be another spike, or maybe there will be one over the winter, but at some point this has got to come down with all the vaccinations, prior infections, et cetera. Um, and at that point, I mean, we still have, uh, we still have the facility 
And uh, we don't, you know, I think one way to keep it, um, I mean, I, I think at this point, there's gonna be some level of SARS uh, COVID-2 testing, unfortunately, um, for the indefinite future, because I don't think we're looking at eradication, right? We're looking at it being endemic and being out there with the flu and with RSV and other sort of common viruses every winter. Um, so we definitely wanna kind of keep, uh, the, keep this running um, and expand it uh, so that you can kind of differentiate and track um, all of those things as well as add anything new that pops up very quickly. I feel it's like it's, I'm sorry. Uh, I was gonna say, I just feel like it's such a unique time when a very large fraction of the college age population in a community is, is undergoing this periodic surveillance testing. Uh, and it may never be possible at least hopefully hopefully it's never possible again to get that kind of uh you know complete population sampling uh, yeah yeah no i mean it's uh, right i mean it is a, it is an, an interesting opportunity to see what else is out there you know how often uh, at what frequencies other stuff is circulating uh etc although i guess one of the consequences of all the sort of masking and distancing and all of that stuff is that um, a lot of the other respiratory pathogens have really taken a hit. I mean, I know we're all supposed to get our flu shots and the CDC is worried about a really bad flu season, but so far there has been almost no flu seen in the US for the second straight year, um, which of course could change over the winter. And I know RSV bounced back um, over the summer and there are plenty of people who've had you know, colds after not seeing RSV for a really long chunk of time. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's sort of like, uh, it's, it, it's an interesting time to be able to look at all of this stuff at the same time, at the same time for the same, you know, for the same reason, like you kind of really have to be focused on dealing with this particular thing. Yeah. And if you could get, you know, watch the recovery of the other respiratory viruses and have, you know, mostly anonymous information, but you know, which dorms people live in together at UCLA or something like that, you could do. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, then you have to like, you know, you have to have a study and you have to take it through the IR, you know, through the institutional review boards and all of that stuff. And I mean, we did some of that to get the early SARS testing off the ground, but we kind of need, we kind of need the bandwidths and maybe people who are unlike us are actual infectious disease experts um, to want to jump in and take advantage of what, uh, of what we've built. The next question asks uh, what you estimate for false positive and false negative results. Um, I don't know. I mean, we've never really had. So, you know, during the times like this summer when we were running tests and there was very little SARS, uh, COVID-2 around, we basically would go for weeks without seeing any positive tests at all. Um, so I think in that kind of environment, our false positive rate is very low. I don't know what I would have, I mean, you know, below my ability to estimate it, you know, much less than 1%. Um, I think false positives, it's not really that the reaction itself will give you a false positive if there is nothing in that well. It's more that there are you know, opportunities for contamination or for a really hot sample to kind of cross over to other stuff. And we take great pains to, uh, screen, uh, to screen that out. Um, false negatives are hard with SARS because it's not really clear exactly what uh, it means to be a true positive. So somebody may genuinely have you know, no detectable virus or very low levels of virus when they spit into that tube because they're super early in their infection. And then a couple of days later, you know, um, they might be, uh, the virus could, uh, you know, um, come up to the point where they'd be symptomatic, right? So we'd miss that. Um, uh, so I think, you know, we're confident that if they have a reasonable viral load that would be detectable um, with, a, with a CT of, you know, below 35 or something like that by qPCR, we'd also call them positive. Um, so we, we, I don't think we miss a lot of those folks, but we definitely return some of our tests as inconclusive or actually when we get something that looks like an inconclusive in that very low range, we rerun them uh, immediately. So we have two shots at it and kind of uh, try to make sure, you know, we, we're confident in returning a positive if we do it or a negative. 
Um, so I see there is a question about sequencing uh, the DNA of uh, individuals. Um, so we're not doing that, and I don't think in this, I mean, we're not, uh, you know, that obviously takes a study and an IRB and all of that stuff. And I don't think like the way we get the samples, there is enough human stuff in there to really do it. Um, and it's not handled in a way that would allow that. But there are large international consortia and UCLA is a large player in this. Um, where they've uh, sequenced tens of thousands of human genomes and looked at um, infection status of those individuals. And there are a number of projects out there uh, showing that there are you know, individuals with mutations in certain uh, genes involved in like the interleukin response, et cetera, um, have, uh, higher, have higher susceptibility. So, um, I, we haven't been involved in that uh, arm of these projects, but that definitely is something that the community is doing. Is UCLA doing weekly testing of all the students? So um, what uh, UCLA has gone back and forth. <laughs> Um, first there was, uh, you know, the testing is available to everybody. Um, at first, they weren't really asking the vaccinated people to test. Then they went to a policy for a chunk of time in August where everybody had to test weekly who was going to be on campus. And now we're back to the unvaccinated must test. And I think that might be twice a week. And the vaccinated are encouraged to test, but not required. Um, so I think a decent number of, you know, uh, vaccinated people test, you know, just for peace of mind or if they're worried they might have been exposed or something like that, but it's not, uh, it's not mandatory. Um, I'm not sure in terms of looking at uh, effectiveness of vaccination. Uh, if uh, I, I know there, there was a study involving UCLA Health uh, employees uh, looking at that together with the UCSD uh, system that was published in the kind of in the early days of the vaccine, showing the same types of real world effectiveness numbers that have been seen elsewhere. But I think as folks know, design, uh, designing those real world effectiveness studies is pretty challenging because of all the confounders and different behaviors um, among people who get the vaccine and don't get the vaccine and test and don't test and so on. So kind of unraveling all of that, I think is tricky. Is it connected to any UCLA COVID surveillance system? Um, yeah, so I mean, all of our positives get reported to uh, both the state as we have to and to UCLA uh, for all the contact tracing and all of that stuff. So, abso so absolutely, they, 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 all of our positives uh, go to the appropriate um, folks, either at UCLA Health or at UCLA Main Campus or whoever they are, um, you know, at the, at the other campuses or the schools, and then they go, that they go into the um, contact tracing, uh, et cetera. Um, all right, so how does swab seek fit in the competitive space of other testing approaches? Um, so I think we did at one point talk to, I'm not, I don't remember if it, I don't think it was Homeland Security, but there was some group that wanted to set up testing at airports. And we looked, you know, we talked to them and looked at the logistics and it didn't really seem like it made um, a lot of sense uh, for us. Um, but I think it's sort of, it just, it, 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 so I guess, I mean, one thing I'll say about SwapSeq is it's, uh, you know, it's efficient, it's relatively lightweight in terms of setting it up in terms of both like instrumentation and people you need. Um, what uh, it's, it, you know, it allows you to test quite inexpensively. It does require you to be test, to be getting samples in at scale. So if you have, you know, let's say at least a thousand samples that you can reliably get in a day and want to test that day and have the results, you know, either late in that day or the next day, depending on when they were collected, it makes sense. If you have samples coming in here and there, 
and you want you know 10 samples tested every day and get the results um, you know that same day or even faster right I mean if, if you want to get them in minutes you obviously need a different technology if you want to get them in hours um, you're probably better off running a uh, conventional qPCR because you do, this doesn't I mean so swapseek offers you you know very high throughput testing but it's it doesn't really make sense when those uh, advantages of scale aren't there. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're over our time just a bit, um, thanks to these wonderful questions. Um, it doesn't look like we have any left in the chat. Um, we probably have time for another one. If not, um, I think we can. Um... All right, well, let me just say thank you for uh, that really wonderful talk today. It's exciting, important work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you all for, thank you all for listening and for the kind comments. Thank you very much for your pivoting, um, Leonid. Um, this is exactly what the Hertz um, commitment is, right? Is to put your science and technology to work on behalf of our country when there is a, a national emergency or a sense of urgency like this. So many thanks to you. And uh, Ruben, many thanks and congratulations to you pivoting in the middle of your PhD to do a side project. Um, for your commitment to our country and the world. So thank you both gentlemen. And I really wanna thank everybody for um, joining us here today. Stay safe, get tested. Um, and, uh, and we hope that you uh, enjoy uh, the remainder of this year and are able to celebrate with family and friends as holiday season quickly approaches. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.